Hello and welcome to our service. Here are your announcements for this week. We are back indoors for all Sunday services, 8 a.m. service, Sunday school, and 11 a.m. service. Adult Bible study will be available in person and on Zoom. Youth Bible study will remain available on Zoom. Reminder that masks are optional for all services. Agapeites, we still need your help. We will be sponsoring a four-bedroom cottage for women and children of domestic violence. We would like for the cottage to represent what our name means, God's perfect love. We are asking for donations or to help with this project. The deadline for us to reach our goal is July 18th. You can give via the church app or you can give in person at the church. Please be sure to write women of domestic violence in the memo portion of your check or on the envelope for getting. Be blessed and be a blessing. Join us for VBS July 19th through 21st. The meeting for VBS volunteers is this Thursday, June 24th at 6 p.m. via Zoom. If you are interested, text VOLUNTEER to 855-977-0554. We look forward to seeing you. It's so important, people of God. To get into the very presence of God. Nothing else matters now. In fact, I want you to find yourself right in the Holy of Holies. I see His presence. I'm in His presence. While I'm there thanking him, I know that I have a right. Whatever I need, he will supply. I believe tonight somebody just wants him to open up the windows of heaven for you. Let it rain. Send down your blessings, Lord. I just need you to move in this place tonight. I just need you to move in this place tonight. He's doing it right now. Hallelujah. Open the floodgates of heaven. Let it rain. Let it rain. Floodgates of heaven, let it rain, let it rain. Help me, somebody say it tonight. Open the floodgates of
you tonight But I feel the rain I feel the rain I feel the rain I feel the rain Anybody feel the rain? Anybody in this place, you feel the rain? I feel the rain. Is there anybody in here, you feel the rain? I feel the rain. I feel the rain. Maybe you need to look at somebody and tell them, it's raining. It's raining. It's raining. It's raining. It's raining. It's raining. Full gospel come to tell you it's raining. It's raining. It's raining. It's raining. Can I just thank you for the rain, Lord? Yeah. Can I just thank you for the rain? Can I just thank you for the rain? church on brother Gary Chapel and I just want to give honor first to God all of the pastors ministers church family and friends here at Agape I just want to say welcome 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 I just pray that all hearts and minds are clear and have a spirit to receive but before we go into the sermon text I would ask that we all bow for a word of prayer our father who are in heaven Lord in the name of Jesus yet again we meet in your house. We pray, Lord, that our hearts and minds are cleared and you will remove anything that would hinder us from receiving the truth of your word. We just pray that your spirit would rain down on us right now, Father. We just thankful, Lord, that you sent your only begotten son, Jesus, to die for our sins, that he shed his blood on Calvary for us. Thank you, Jesus. If we had a million tongues, we couldn't say it enough, but I'll just say it with the one I have. I'll just say thank you, Jesus, for saving me and as you sit on high, I pray you would intercede on my behalf. My Father, I pray you lower your ear to my prayer one more time. Holy Spirit, have your way. Fill us with the Spirit of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, I say welcome to all who are listening and watching, but I won't be before you long. Matthew chapter 14, verse 28. Matthew chapter 14, verse 28. Verse number 28 says, Then Peter called to him, him being Jesus, and said, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on water. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. I myself personally, I think that it's always very, very important and helpful to lay the foundation for the sermon text that will go forward. I think that's very, very important to point the people of God in the right direction, in the direction that the sermon text will be going. And that, and the main reason for that being it is, it sets the tone and points everyone in the direction for which the sermon text is purpose to accomplish. So it points the saints in the direction in which we'll be going. And with, and with that be, being said, one thing I want to talk about, I want to talk about something, I want to use it just for illustration purposes, and it's something that, that us Southerners may be familiar with. I know in California you may have heard of it, or sometimes, and sometimes it may have happened. And this certain thing is called 
a thunderstorm, a thunderstorm warning, a thunderstorm warning, a thunderstorm warning, a severe thunderstorm warning is a severe weather warning product issued by regional offices of weather forecasting agencies throughout the world. And it is a warning to alert the public that severe thunderstorms are imminent or are occurring at the present time. And a severe thunderstorm warning is issued when Doppler radar, trained storm spotters, or local emergency management personnel indicate that a thunderstorm is producing large hail winds that are capable of causing significant damage. And it is expected to continue producing severe weather along the storm's projected path. Remember, I'm just trying to guide us in the right direction. Just follow along with me for a second. And with this storm, it may come with some severe flooding. Yes, a severe thunderstorm comes with severe flooding. Severe flooding is caused when torrential rainfall is produced due to the magnitude of the thunderstorm. And in these cases, then a flood advisory or flash flood warning may be issued to alert the public of the flooding threat. But I had to ask myself, so if that is an earthly storm, what is a spiritual storm? We have to know there is such a thing because everything that God created on earth can be likened to the kingdom and be used for the illustration purposes of strengthening his people and revealing his kingdom to them. So for clarity, let's compare the two. Let's compare the two, an earthly storm and a spiritual storm. You see, a physical storm is whereas there are dark clouds, thunder and lightning, and the sun refuses to shine. And with this gloominess, there is also lots of rain. Yes, those clouds will bring about some rain. But, but, but you see, a spiritual storm has some of those same characteristics. Well, how do I say that? Because when going through a spiritual storm, there will be some cloudy days and some dark nights. And even some drops will fall, but they'll fall in the form of tears. But even though these two storms had much in common, there is one area that they both differ. Yeah, there's, a, there's an area that they differ. The most highly visible difference between the two is soon the physical storm shall pass. Yes, the, the physical storm won't last always, but when it comes to a spiritual storm, one may have to weather it much, much longer. And it won't be over until God says, that it is. You see, we have no power over the earthly storm, but our spiritual storm's time span is dictated and predicated upon our relationship with God. Our connection with him dictates how long our spiritual storms may last. And during these times, we must praise, pray, and persevere. This is the only way that we'll be able to weather this spiritual storm, because whenever we experience these types of storms, God is doing a great work in us, and he is taking us to another level in him. Anytime God allows or permits a spiritual storm in your life, it's not to push you away from him, but it's actually to draw you closer to him. And with all that being said, and I hope that everyone is on the right path with me, the sermon title for today is Prepare for the storm, yes, prepare for the storm. And it's coming out of the book of Mark in chapter 6, verses 45 through 52. Mark chapter 6, verses 45 through 52. And just for the purpose of understanding, prior to verses 45 through 52, Jesus and his disciples had just finished Service. Yeah, they had just finished service. They had just ministered to over 5,000 men, women, and children along the seashore, and they were very, very tired. You have to know they were tired. This very act here speaks of the story how Jesus fed all 5,000 with just two fish and five loaves of bread. And you can find that in chapters 30 through 44 in Mark chapter 6 as well. So you see after this, after servicing, so many souls and having such a big service with over 5,000 people, you had to know that Jesus and these disciples were very tired and were in need of rest. So as we pick up in verse number 45, it says, immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his, his disciples get back into the boat 
and head across the lake to Bethsaida while he went and sent the people home. So after the sermon, Jesus now tells the disciples to head on across the shore and he'll send the people home. Verse number 46 says that after telling everyone goodbye, he went up into the hills himself to pray. And late that night, the disciples were in their boat in the middle of the lake and Jesus was alone on the land. Remember that, remember that. And verse 48 says he saw that they were in serious trouble. They were rowing hard and struggling against the wind and the waves. It sounds like a thunderstorm to me. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them walking on water and he intended to pass them by. But when they saw him walking on the water, they cried out in terror, thinking he was a ghost. They were all terrified when they saw him, but Jesus spoke to them at once and said, don't be afraid, he said, take courage, I am here. Then he climbed into the boat and the wind stopped. They were totally amazed, for they still didn't understand the significance of the miracle of the loaves, for their hearts were too hard to take it in. So picking up at verse number 45, now as we began to unpack this, just, just, just lean your ear for a second. In verse number 45, Jesus insisted that his, his disciples get back into the boat and head across the lake, and he stayed back to send the people home. And the reason Jesus did this, Jesus did that so that he could now find some time for himself after ministering to so many people. And one thing that is very important, yes, it's very important, no matter who you are or what capacity you serve in, you have to make sure you're being ministered to as well. Yes, that's why Jesus sent the disciples away. That way he now can find time for himself. You can't always be. This is very important. This is very important. You can't always be pouring in to other people and you're never being poured into yourself. Why can't you do that? Simply because if you don't have anything inside of you, how can you pour something in to someone else? That is the reason being why how so many times so many uh, ministries are ineffective simply because they're not being poured into their sales. But the key thing is we have to make sure that we take advantage of Sunday school. We have to make sure that we take advantage of Bible study because these are the times when we get, get refresh ourselves as ministers so we can't look past it. And Jesus always did one thing. Anything that Jesus did, he did it for a reason. He did it for a purpose. He did it to leave an example to let us know what it is that we should do. And moving on to verse number 46, it says, after telling everyone goodbye, he went up into the hills himself to pray. It's very important. It's very important that you get your alone time with God. But also, this is why Prayer is so important and your alone time with God is so important. Prayer makes us more like Jesus and it reveals to us the heart and mind of God. We all have to have a hunger and a thirst to seek after the heart and mind of God. Why is it so important to know the heart and mind of God? Because that's the only way he can reveal his will to you and his desires that he has and his plans that he has for your life. And surely we know that prayer is detrimental to our lives because when we look at the spiritual powerhouses, of the past, we know that prayer was immersely important to them and was the catalyst to their deliverance. I say it a lot, I say it a lot. Prayer is the catalyst to our deliverance. How do I know that? Simply the word of God says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, he made sure that prayer was in the center of the, and pray and turn from their wicked ways. Then God will hear. How can he hear unless you call upon him and let you pray? So we see here Jesus and the disciples had ministered all night, and now Jesus has sent them away in the boat. I just want us to get a clear picture of this. So now they've ministered. And Jesus has sent the disciples away, and he's went along to be with the Father. Jesus knew it was time. To pray, he had to be built back up because we also have to remember now, Jesus was 100% human as well. And this signifies the importance of rest because ministry is both physically and spiritually draining. And if Jesus needed to restore, surely we have to as well. But here now as we move on to verse number 47, this is where we began to understand really the, the meat of the sermon text for today. And I really hope that someone will benefit from it. Remember I said the sermon title is Prepare for the Storm. You see, after a great day of service, the disciples had to be feeling pretty good. 
Just imagine how good we'll feel here if there's no sitting room and we've served many, many people. And you had to imagine out of those 5,000, at least a couple hundred or maybe a couple thousand maybe, maybe had, had, had accepted Christ as their Lord. But again, ministry is not always easy. And that is why we always have to be prepared because we don't know when the next storm will rise. You see, after the disciples got into the boat, after servicing all the people, the last thing on their mind was a storm was heading their way. They got back into the boat as business as usual. They planned on making it to the other side with ease, without any problems. But verse number 47 says, late that night, the disciples were in the boat in the middle of the lake and Jesus was alone on the land. It's important to, to, to picture that because you have to see now that they are alone, they are now Un, away from the covering of Jesus, but Brother Mark made it made it clear, and he pointed out to show that when it comes to life, yeah, when it comes to life and ministry, there will be some times and some things we'll have to fight alone and on our own until our help arrives, and that's why he begins with acknowledging that the, that the disciples were in the middle of the lake, and Jesus was on the shore, pointing out the fact that now they were alone. It is very important to be spiritually self-sustaining. Yeah, you have to be spiritually self-sustaining because you might not always have the body or the building. How do I know that? COVID-19 just proved it over the last year. Over this last year, there's so many people who were not self-sustaining that we still have not seen yet since the doors have been opened. Some people depend on the body and the building, but you have to be self-sustaining no matter where you are. And you see, this is very important that you gain this, this spiritual connection and relationship with God that may that way you may sustain yourself. Because the same way it is, if you're in your house and there's a thunderstorm outside, the moment you remove yourself from that house and you step outside, now you're susceptible to everything that comes your way. It's the same way when we remove ourselves from the covering of Jesus. And so many saints struggle and become fragile and even some turn away once the building is closed. But simply, but simply because they didn't have that personal connection, it's important to have that personal connection. But even when we stray, Jesus is still watching. That's why he said they were in the middle of the lake and Jesus was on the shore. The whole time, Jesus never took his eyes off the disciples. In verse number 48, it says he saw that they were in serious trouble. Yeah, Jesus will stand back sometimes and, and watch you in your troubles. He'll keep a close eye on you and not make a move. But he, it says he saw that they were in serious trouble. They were rowing hard and struggling against the wind and waves. That sounds like a great storm to me. You see, this storm caught the disciples off guard. Yes, yes, yes. Just like the trials of life can sneak up on us and catch us off guard without the covering of Jesus. The waves in this text signify the troubles of life. Yeah, those waves signifies the troubles of life, but also that's why Mark pointed out that Jesus was not with them. Hence the point. He's pointing out that when you're not constantly close to Jesus, anything is bound to happen. That's why you don't waste a day or an hour without making sure that you're still close to Jesus. You see, when, 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 when you distance yourself from Jesus, you leave yourself vulnerable and susceptible to physical or emotional attacks and any sort of harm or demonic spirit. But the second part of verse 48 is really where he tops it off. In verse number 48, in the second half, the B clause, it says about 3 o'clock. Not in the evening, but 3 o'clock in the morning. So that means Jesus watched them fight against this storm all day. It sounds like some kind of, some spiritual storms I've been through myself. It seemed like it just won't be over, but the whole time Jesus was still watching them from afar, and it says, about three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them, walking on the water, but here's the kicker, here's the kicker. <laughs> he came walking towards them on water, but his intention was not to get into the boat with him. His intentions was to pass them by. Why did Jesus intend to pass them by after he seen them in this tremendous storm? Well, simply because of their unbelief. If you go back to, 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 to the story of him feeding the 5,000, the disciples didn't even believe that he had uh, uh, completed that miracle. So when they left the shores and Jesus put them back in the boat, he already knew their hearts because they still were amazed that he was able to do that. And that was a spirit of unbelief. So Jesus intended to pass them by simply because they did.
did not believe and he intended to pass them by. But this is good. This is good because 3 o'clock in the morning, you have to look at this. It said Jesus came at 3 o'clock in the morning. And that is when Jesus, like, he likes to visit us because we are in our subconscious minds. As we are in our subconscious minds, most of the time when God spoke to anyone, he usually put them into a deep sleep or spoke to them in a dream because that's where he can, he can talk to us and we can hear clearly without any distractions or anything to take our attention away from him. Well, what is a subconscious mind? A subconscious mind is the part of our mind that is not currently in focal awareness. That means you're not currently aware of anything, so that means you're, the ear of your heart is open to God's voice, hence the reason why that's the best time for God to speak, because he has our undivided attention, and there won't be any physical or mental distractions but that will cause a break in our communica in communication. But going on to verse number 49, this is where our faith plays a big part. Yes, but verse number 49 says, but when they saw him walking on the water, they cried out in terror. Well, who do you think they called when they cried out? <laughs> they were thinking he was a ghost. Yeah, yeah, the disciples seen someone walking on the water and they thought it was a ghost, but they cried out. But I wonder whose name did they call? I'm pretty sure they called on Jesus, looking right at it, not even knowing it was him. But the reason they cried out and thought Jesus was a ghost again, it was just because of their unbelief. And that's the same reason why Jesus was going to pass them by. In the book of Mark, chapter 9, verse 23 and 24, Jesus said unto him, him being the demon-possessed boy's father. This is like one of the greatest uh, scriptures in the Bible. The, the, the demon-possessed boy's father, Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believe it. And immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. But the man had enough courage to ask Jesus this question. But help me. Help me, Jesus, overcome my unbelief. That's one thing we have to ask God. We have to ask God, we have to ask Jesus for the strength to help us with our unbelief. It's not a saint alive that does not battle with this at one point or another in their lives. Everyone has this struggle of unbelief. There will be some waves and some storms that will come in our lives that will make us have this spirit of unbelief. But it's not anything wrong unless you don't ask for some help, but the key factor to unbelief is a lack of knowledge. Yes, the key factor to unbelief is a lack of knowledge. And as Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6 says, my people are destroyed. We've all heard this one from a lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. I also reject you as my priest because you have ignored the laws of God. And I will ignore you as my children. And the devil is right there. Yeah, the devil is right there to take full advantage of our ignorance. And he'll tell you things like you're sick, you're broke, you're depressed, and even that you're a failure. But, but, but the upside to that is Satan is overruled by the word of God. Yes, Satan has no power over the word of God. As a matter of fact, the word of God is our only weapon of offense. That means that's the only thing we can use against the devil to attack the devil and the rest of the armors of God are all defense mechanisms, meaning they are there to protect. But the only offensive weapon that we have against the devil is the word of God. And if you know this, you can't object to the, to the claims of the devil. But if you don't, you will buy right into what the devil is selling and you will stay right where you are. So you can't have that spirit of unbelief. But verse number 50 says they were all terrified when they saw him. So now we've went through most of the chapters and we see now Jesus has came out on the water and the disciples think that he's a ghost simply because they didn't believe. And now they're terrified when they saw him. But Jesus spoke. It's so good when he speaks. He spoke to them at once and he said, don't be afraid. He said, take courage. I am here. Even in unbelief, Jesus is still faithful. Yes, yes, yes. He's still faithful for just as God remains faithful when we're faithless. Jesus does the same as well. And yet, we have a promise from God that he will never leave us, nor will he forsake us. God is at work in us, in our difficulties and in the situations, even though trials and challenges will not always be removed from our lives. Hebrew, Hebrew chapter 13, verse 5 and 6 says, keep your lives free from the love of money. I mean, don't tie yourself to the things of the world and be content with what you have. 
Because God said he would never leave you nor forsake you. So don't store your treasures on the things of this earth. Store them in the kingdom. Then he says in verse number six, he says, so we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? This is our promise and foundation of the love that God has for us. But here is where the shout really comes in in verse number 51. It says, then Jesus climbed into the boat and he finally got in the boat, even though the, the disciples didn't believe. And soon as he stopped and got into the boat, all the wind and the waves stopped and they were totally amazed. But the, the, the minute Jesus stepped into the boat, the trouble stopped. Was simply said the moment they called on his name. So that will further convince me that when they thought it was a ghost out on the water, the first name they called was Jesus. So they believed somewhat. So 2 Corinthians 4 and 17 says, For our present troubles are small, and they won't last very long. Yeah, the present troubles are small, they won't last very long, but yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever, yet they produce glory. All I have to say is there is power in the name of Jesus. I, I pray that everyone exercises that power, because when you call on his name, it's a difference. It's a difference when you just know Jesus is around. We can sit in here all day knowing that Jesus is in the building with us, but it's not until we call on his name that it activates his strong. A strong form. And last but not least, in verse number 52, it says, For well, they still didn't understand. Wow, that's crazy. Even after all this, after the 5,000, after Jesus walking on water, verse number 52 starts with, They still didn't. They still didn't understand the significance of the miracle of the loaves, for their hearts were too hard to take it in. That's a scary thing to have. A hard heart again here is that unbelief. So I want to park here for a minute, just one second, and let's take a minute to understand the detrimental results of a hard heart. Yeah, that's there's some detrimental results to a hardened heart. And considering this is easy to see how a hard heart can dull a person's ability to perceive and understand. Yes, a hard heart can block out your ability to understand and perceive when someone's trying to pour into it and pour into you and anyone's heart can be hardened, even faithful Christians. As a matter of fact, the devil needs not to harden the heart of an unbeliever because he already has their heart and their mind, but the hearts of the believer are the ones that are mainly under attack day and night by the devil. In fact, even in Mark chapter 8, verse 17 through 19, we see Jesus and his own disciples suffering from this malady. Not Jesus, I'm sorry, his disciples. His disciples suffering from this very thing. In verses 17 through 19, and when Jesus knew it, he said unto them, why reason ye? That means why are you questioning? Because ye had no bread. Why are you worrying? Why are you questioning? Because you had no bread. Perceive ye not yet, neither do you understand? And have ye your heart yet hardened? In verse number 18 in Mark chapter 8, it said, You have eyes and you see not, having ears and you hear not, and you do not remember. When I break the five loaves among 5,000, how many baskets full of fragments took you up? They said unto him, Twelve. So after they knew it was only two fish and five loaves of bread, and they fed 5,000, they walked away with 12 baskets full of bread. How did they still walk away? Not believing the disciples really are no different than man. Today, God can do so many amazing things in our lives time and time again. And the next trouble that befalls us, we again find ourselves operating in this spirit of unbelief, just as the disciples did. But thankfully, with God, no matter how hard our hearts get or how distant we might become towards him, 2 Timothy 2 and 13 tells us he is still faithful. To us, yes, he, he remains faithful for the simple fact being his name and reputation is on the line. He's not going to let his name go bad or his word come back void. So no matter what we do, God is going to protect his reputation. Yes, he's going to protect his reputation. But a hard heart towards God can be caused by a number of different things. Yeah, there are a few things that can cause that. The common cause is being disappointment, unbelief, bitterness. But the greatest of all those or sin. Yes, sin is the greatest. Sin is the main problem we battle with each day, but we can rejoice because Jesus 
Jesus paid it all and he overcame death, burial, and the grave. How do I know that Jesus overcame death, burial, and the grave? Because in Acts 2, 23 and 24, it says, this man was handed over. This man being Jesus. Yes, Jesus was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan. That means that was God's plan to hand Jesus over to sinners like us and for knowledge and with you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. Yes, God handed him over to man to be nailed to the cross, but God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep his hold on Jesus. And now that he has risen, he is available to all and he desires that none should perish, but that all would come to repentance and seek what must they do to be saved. But in order to be saved, you have to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart on the Lord Jesus that God raised him from the dead. For with the heart man believe unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And as the scriptures say, anyone who believes in Jesus shall not be put to shame. But, 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 but verse number 12 says, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. That means anyone can come to Jesus. But the same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It did not say you might be saved, but it says anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jesus is the only way. The word of God tells us, Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Why do you need to ask Jesus the way? Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto me, unto the Father, but by me. If ye had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him and have seen him, because you are looking at him right now in me. It's all about Jesus. He paid it all. So we can't really take it for granted that Jesus paid it all. And I hope that no one passes up this opportunity. But I know that people are thinking, well, 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 I'm a sinner and I've done pretty bad. What I have to say is all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But, but, but the upside to that is while we were yet sinners, Christ died. So I pray that if it, there's anyone who's going, to, going through a spiritual storm, that you will reach out here to us at Agape Community Church in Lancaster, and, and we will surely have someone meet with you and go over the desires of the heart of God. We all have to seek after the heart and the mind of God that we may understand his will for our lives. So if there's anyone who has not accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior, I pray that you would contact us here at Agape. And I just pray that this word falls on the heart of every man, woman, and child who is listening today, that it will take root and it will bring about much fruit. Let's bow. Our Father, God in heaven, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I pray. Thank you, Lord, for the storms of life. For if it had not been for the storms, Father, I may have not ever came towards you. But I'm glad that the storms tend to push us closer and not further. I pray that my heart continue to be open to your word and to your voice, Father. And I pray that everyone that's listening and watching today, Father, will be blessed by your word today. Holy Spirit, continue to shower us with the power of God. Bring his words of old to our remembrance, convicting where there is seeing, converting where change is needed, and confirming the word of God in our lives. And Jesus, we just forever give you praise, honor, and glory for overcoming death, burial, and the grave, and rising for our sins. And as you sit on high, we pray you to see on our behalf, my Father. Glory you to our prayer one more time. Keep us until we meet again, Lord. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Thank you so much for tuning in. Be sure to check the description box below for all the special announcements that we made and also for information on how to tithe and give. Also, if you decided to give your life to Christ today, please text your name and your address to 661-505-8626 and we'll be sure to get some stuff to you to help you on your Christian walk. Once again, we love you with a godly love. We can't love you unless Jesus Christ loves you through us. Stay safe and have a blessed week.